I managed Leon Spinks, former heavyweight champ. I managed Tyrone Booz, former cruiserweight champ. Junior middleweight champ Buster Drayton, featherweight champ Freddie Norwood, and for a, the briefest of periods, a guy named uh, Jose Rivera, who was the welterweight champ. You fix fights to make betting money. You fix fights to get a fighter a championship. You fix fights to maneuver a fighter up the ranks toward a championship fight. You fix fights to win in order, again, to position someone strategically. You fix fights to lose in order to get paid and in order to make, you know, betting coups. The way you fix fights varies greatly. You fix fights by buying judges. That's, you know, that's one easy way to do it. You fix fights by having the referee working for you so that if there's any way that the ref can stop a fight in your guy's favor, he does. You fix fights by colluding with the fighters, generally the loser. It's, all, it's almost always a loser. Um, winners almost never know that the fight is fixed. One of the things that you're cognizant of when you are fixing fights is that you're doing something illegal. Something that theoretically can wind you up, you know, wind you in jail and, and get people angry at you. So you never really say anything. You know, nothing that's culpable. So there's a code. And if you're in boxing for a while, you know the code. Everybody knows the code. You will go uh, into a gym where there's either a trainer or a manager, and you're looking for somebody your guy can beat. This is how these guys make their money. And it's interesting that people who lose in boxing, generally speaking, if they're professional losers, can make more money than winners. Winning costs money. Losing makes money. Now, that's not true, obviously at an elite level, but at almost every other level, it's the case. So what you do is you say, I've got a guy, and he is looking for work. Looking for work is the first. Okay, so it means that he needs to win, and, you know, and you want to keep him busy. The response to that is, I've got somebody. And generally, the second phrase is, but he hasn't been in the gym too much. OK, so the subtext there is he's, he's not in good shape. And so you're honing in on where this thing is going to go. And you say, that, that, that's OK. You know, I'd like a guy to get in a, a, a few rounds. That means it's going to be a knockout. At which point he goes, well, you know, OK, I can do that. But really, my, my guy isn't in shape to go more than three or four. That's okay. So you've just fixed the fight. Nobody's done anything illegal. Nobody's done anything where they've come out and stated anything explicitly. But that's a done deal. And you get you get what you pay for. Can you say how many fights you fixed? Hundreds. How many, I'm not sure, but hundreds. I see it all the time now. I mean, I don't make my living in boxing anymore, but I see fixes all the time, sure. It will always exist. It always has, always will. With over 90 countries in six continents tuning in, it's showtime! Vegas, I think, tends toward the sensational. Irish Hurricane Peter McNeely! <laughs> keep laughing, keep laughing. They'll feel funny, huh? If you go, if any one of you doesn't respect me or what I'm doing or what I've been doing for the last three months since it's been announced, you're going against a guy like this, 
You have a big dump in your pants. Talk to him, Peter. I'm Hurricane Peter McNeely from Medfield, Mass. On Saturday night, watch me kick Tyson's ass. But if you haven't made your pay-per-view arrangements yet, make them soon. Because remember what happens when I wrap you in my cocoon. McNeely's manager was a guy named Vin Vecchioni. Vecchioni had no money, so I, for a while, was bankrolling what they were doing. I was bringing McNeely and sometimes, and Vecchioni to New York for various things, you know, and I was making fights for Peter. So, I mean, I knew them very well, and I was very involved in what was going on. So I bring Vecchioni to Al Braverman's office, who's Don King's director of boxing, and we work out a deal for McNeely to be Tyson's first opponent, which is a completely win-win situation for everybody. I'm just happy to be here. Everybody's made their statements. Um, Mr. McNeely had a cute statement. I'm just re ready to fight. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Thank you. I get a phone call from a guy whose voice I recognize, but not, not somebody I really know. But, you know, he said, look, somebody thought I should give you a call to let you know um, that a bet got made that the fight wouldn't... Yeah, I'm trying to remember how he described it. I think he told me the fight won't go... It's, it's not going to go 90 seconds. It was, uh, you know, it was a million dollar bet and the fight's not going to go 90 seconds. Somebody thought you might be interested in that. Mills Lane, stop that nonsense because they were starting to butt heads. Oh. Tyson with a left hook, a right hook, and down goes McNeely up there. McNeely's hurt this time, Steve. He's very hurt. He can barely stand up. In his way, he's only got 30 seconds left. They want Tyson to be able to. 89 seconds, at which point Vin Vecchioni steps between the ropes to prompt the ending to the fight. Correct. That was not correct. That was not correct. He quit. That's it. He quit. He quit. He has quit. He didn't quit. His corner threw in the towel. He didn't quit at all. McNeely didn't quit at all. His corner didn't quit at all. Vecchioni, who really had this thing figured out, understood that it was crucial that there be no finding of impropriety because Tyson was the machine on which boxing ran, by far the biggest earner in the world. And, you know, when, when he fights in Vegas, they generate a, a billion dollars in added revenue. I mean, not from boxing per se, but you know, for, from all of the ancillary re revenue. So it has to be okay. And Vecchioni knows that. So he gets his payday, whatever it is, and I don't know what it is. I never did know what it was. And I get a phone call from, from him. And I'm still in Puerto Rico. He goes, I, I, you gotta come to the house, I gotta see you. And I said, I'm, I can't do it, I'm, I'm still out of the country. And he says, send somebody you trust. And when that somebody got there, he was given an envelope, and that envelope put my son through college. I got hit, you know, I got knocked down. The man's quick, he hits hard. I felt like the, I felt like the first knockdown was a, a, a good, good quick punch. On my part, it was a little bit of a flash knockdown, I was okay. The second knockdown, as the film will show, I was shaking and I slipped and I fell on the rope and I, twi I twisted part of my knee. You see the, f hey, hey, you see the face? Look at the film. Just look at the film. Look at the film. My knee buckled. My knee buckled without even getting hit. Look at the film. Imagine that you're up against a very well placed, high profile machine that is capitalized to a degree that you can't even begin to imagine. A billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry. So this is a guy with nothing, except for his brain and his nerve. And I'm thinking, okay, 
I know now he's got 90 seconds to make his move. And there has to be a plausible reason to do it. You can't just walk into the ring. So you've got to watch this thing and you have to figure out, when can I do this? And anybody who's got the kind of nerve from that background dealing with what's on the other side, you know, the establishment side, to wait until one second to step in. If you don't admire that, I don't know that you see things that I don't, because to me, that is the greatest single underdog score that that I've ever seen in, in all of my years in boxing. You know, the single most savvy maneuver that I've ever seen. If you're in the boxing business, if you're doing it worldwide, you're going to run into gangsters. It's always been a, a sport that's had a lot of criminal activity. The Russian mob and the mafia, both factions figured out that I really did know my way around the game a lot, understood a lot about boxing. And so I wound up making some fights for mob guys and of both stripes um, and fixing some fights for some people but there were problems that that showed up some things didn't go our way some bad things happened well obviously they didn't send somebody I mean they didn't send somebody to kill me because here I am I got a phone call from somebody I knew who said that I better take care of things. I better iron out this problem. Uh, if I don't hear from you in two weeks, we'll have to uh, resolve this uh, in a different way. Uh, I really hope that we can resolve this the right way. Uh, I mean, if I have to take a trip to Puerto Rico and we can discuss this, that's, that's entirely up to you. So I brokered a deal that allowed me to get out. 